I'm Aubrey Sitterson, and this is Scald. You're listening to the only story that matters. This is true oral storytelling, written to be performed and then recorded in one single flawless take. Every episode of Scald is the best episode yet. So don't stress about listening from the beginning. Instead, dive in right here. If you want to go back and catch up later, you can always check out previous installments of the podcast or buy the prose volumes on Amazon, including the just-released Scald Volume 3, Broken World. But more on that after the show. This isn't me reading you a story. This is me telling you a story. This is Scald, Part 52. The dwarves' eyes burned from the sweat running down their brows, from the chips of wood tossed up by their swinging axes, and from the panic that consumed them as they frantically worked. This was nothing new. This was their job, their responsibility, their lot in life. For a dwarf in the elf realm, there were no choices. The most dexterous of them were taught their race's ancient forging techniques, how to make that layered steel with an unmatched strength, a metal as steadfast and unyielding as the dwarves themselves. And they were made blacksmiths, commanded to arm the high elf legions. And the rest... The rest of the dwarven race, the ones who had long ago acquiesced to the demands of the elves, they who, instead of watching their once mighty kingdoms trampled into dust, had ceded their destiny to their new rulers, had become vassals of the high elf kingdoms. They were sent to do what elves thought dwarves best at, at that which the high elves believed them unmatched. Hard physical labor. The majority were sent to the mines, those snaking, dark, treacherous tunnels where the dwarves worked to carve the earth's closely guarded riches out of solid stone. But some, the fastest, strongest, and most loyal of the bunch were sent here, to the cavernous room deep beneath the high elf castle, that royal abode where they worked tirelessly, day and night, sometimes collapsing from exhaustion as they struggled to ensure that those roots, those quickly growing, clever roots, the ones that, when having met resistance, simply turned and twisted, continuing their growth unabated, to ensure that their growth was held in check, to make sure that the world tree was kept in its place. They did their duty silently, communicating with grunts and with hand gestures, saving their breath for the laborious work that was their curse. They panted heavily as they took axes to that living growing wood. They breathed in and out at a frantic pace as they worked together, cutting through that heavy, mystical bark with saws so large they required two dwarves on either side. But though heavy breathing and exhausted panting were nothing new in that cavernous chamber, suddenly the room filled with another noise. Gasps. Every dwarf in the chamber gasped, drawing breath in sharply, a show of surprise, confusion, and terror. 
as though they were used to seeing the world tree, their world tree, the world tree, reach out when given the opportunity, though they had seen its roots stretch forward and tear open holes in reality, though they had gazed through passageways to the worlds that had long ago split from their own, the realms created by the sundering, when they gazed upon now was something different, something altogether more terrifying. And inexplicable. They had seen their world tree bridge the dangerous gap between the worlds, had seen it reach out to other mysterious, often unknowable realms. But now, it was their world that was breached. It was their world that was invaded as portals were torn in the air itself, ripped open by powerful, living, unchecked growth, stretched open wide by roots. Roots that though they looked familiar, though they shared the same celestial aura as the world tree, were not from the world tree, were not from their world tree. It was unprecedented. It was unexplainable. It was disastrous. It chipped away at everything they knew, at everything they worked for, at everything they had been told. It chipped away at the foundations of their existence, the kingdom of the high elves, and the nature of the sundered worlds themselves. As they stood in shock, as they stared in awe, as they were held transfixed by horror and confusion. One dwarf, the oldest amongst them, hundreds of years if he was a day, the foreman of that work-hardened crew, began to bellow his commands, wasting no effort to conceal the fear that had overtaken him. Don't just stand there. Beat them back. Split them into kindling. Hold the line. And as his men and women dashed forward, bearing axes, bearing saws, bearing determined, albeit frightened, grimaces, he looked back at the young dwarf who served as his assistant. And you, run, now, take word to Queen Endleth, run like your life depends on it, like all our lives depend on it, because it does and they do. Go! They rushed to and fro, not frantically, not haphazardly or carelessly, but instead with a shocking precision and exactness. These were elves, but not just any elves. These were not fey, gentle, artful creatures. No, the only art these elves knew, the only one they practiced, the only one they valued was combat, the exquisite art of war as these elves were soldiers highly trained and deadly but more than just soldiers these elves were something else they were warriors a soldier is a part of a whole a soldier is the building block of an army, only useful in mass, only effective as part of a group. But these elves were more. They were better. They were warriors. They were true warriors. Though they knew how to move as a single entity, how to sacrifice the lives of the few for the goals of the many, they also knew how to fight as single entities. Each was capable of taking on hordes of enemies, deftly wielding the swords, scimitars, bows, and spears with which they now armed themselves. An army comprised of soldiers is deadly. But destroy its general, and what are you left with? A headless, quavering corpse. But an army comprised of warriors made up of those who even alone, even after seeing every last one of their comrades cut down, can still stand proud, can still stand tall, can still mete out death unerringly until their body gives out from exhaustion. That army is 
not merely deadly. It is devastating. And that is the army that now mustered, that strapped on finely wrought armor of leather, of scale, and of plate, that armed itself with weapons not issued by some unbending rule or decree, but were chosen and selected based on each warrior's individual strengths and weaknesses. And once readied, once prepared, once their armor had been donned, their bows strung and their blades sharpened, this was the army that set to work, preparing the palanquin. Though it was highly utilitarian, made of wood both sturdy and light, there was nonetheless something regal about it, as it boasted the unmistakable hint of royalty in its design. Appointments. The warriors worked diligently to prepare it, to ready it for its royal cargo. But though these proud elves, male and female alike, were born, bred, and trained for battle, not a one thought this mundane task beneath them. They knowingly prepared for every eventuality every outcome that was conceivable, and even some that weren't. They had to. They had no choice. They had to prepare. They had to be cautious because they had a long, treacherous journey ahead of them, a journey that could not be traversed by solely magical means. Because their destination, their goal, was a city cloaked in magics beyond their ken. Though their people had studied magic's primal, arcane, and divine for generations, the city they now marched upon was wreathed in magics of an incomprehensible power because the city they now marched on was Ravenna. The warriors, having prepared the palanquin, having readied that royal conveyance, stood proudly at attention presented themselves for inspection of their armor, of their weapons, of their very bearing and stance as they were looked over by their leader, the first among equals, a battle-hardened elf that bore a limp, not shamefully, but proudly, as it was evidence of the sacrifice that he had made for his people. And the grizzled old veteran was satisfied when he had tightened his armor, critiqued form, and castigated those warriors foolish enough to have their weapons at anything less than razor sharpness. He nodded, and he smiled ever so slightly. Without looking, he gave a subtle hand signal to the bannermen, who raised their flags in unison. And the flags... Those proud symbols elicited that triumphant blast, the one that rang out from the polished brass trumpets, the taut drum heads, and elven throats, brimming with passion. It was a resounding cheer that echoed off the trees, that rang out joyfully and filled the hidden, immortal, unchanging arbor, a jubilant cry that called forth her, that tall, proud, Powerful female elf, the lady protector of the forest, the beautiful, vibrant, mighty queen of the pharaoh. She nodded graciously to her warriors and flashed that inimitable smile, the one that inspired loyalty so deep that it went beyond death. And she spoke, spoke softly, like one who knows full well the power of their speech. To Ravenna, to take back what is ours. The shift was over, mercifully over. For fourteen brutal, relentless hours, Maul had worked in that steaming, stinking cave, 
taking load after load of that sickening gruel, that slop made from his fellow workers, from his rivals, from his competition, from those who would aim to usurp his place, those so insolent to think themselves capable of taking the place of the one true king of men, the one true king of flames and ashes, King Maul. Though he could feel their hateful stares upon him, could feel them boring holes into his broad, powerful back, hour after hour, shift after shift, day after day, week after week, could hear the spiteful, jealous mutters as they watched him accomplish more, accomplish it faster, and accomplish it better than they could ever hope to. Though he was degraded, though he had lost something crucial, had lost that which defined and animated him, though he was but a husk of the man he once was, the man he was meant to be, the man who was destined to cut a bloody swath across the sundered worlds, he was still a king, and beyond comparison to the slaves that showered him with resentment. Hour after hour, shift after shift, day after day, it was always the same. Maul knew that he was meant for better, that he deserved better. What choice did he have? He had no chance of escape now. He was too well guarded, and when he wasn't, he was too exhausted. The food they gave him, the only nourishment they offered, was poison. He was too hungry not to eat it. He had disgust for the slaves, but no real malice. They were beneath contempt. They were beneath his seething, all-consuming hatred. But if they would attempt to take his place, if they would attempt to make him useless, if they would attempt to hinder his ability to keep moving, to keep breathing, to keep working, to keep his meager, dwindling hopes for freedom, for triumph, for what he deserved, for what was rightfully his, to keep them alive. What other choice did he have? He had no choice. He had no choice but to work or die, to eat or die, to obey or die. Freedom wasn't an option. Triumph wasn't an option. Not the way he wanted it. Not the way that he would accept it. The only way that he could taste freedom, the only way that he could Feel triumph was through defeat, through submission, through giving up and allowing that inky black void of nothingness to overtake him. He had no choice but to work, but to sweat, but to suffer, to eat and sleep and start the cycle all over again. Hoping in vain for some release for something different, for an opportunity, for options, for choices, but knowing that they would not come, that they could not come. The die had been cast. He had been cast into this awful, steaming, stinking purgatory, and he had no choice but to obey. And he had no choice and that worker, that slave, that insolent fool made to leave ahead of him, ahead of Maul, ahead of the one true king of men, the one true king of flames and ashes. It was at the end of his shift. Time to trudge back to the barracks, back to his hard, vermin-infested bed, back to the bowl of that putrid milk waiting for him, back to that restless sleep, the dreams racked by the spasming of his broken, shattered mind, back to another miserable, too short night, one that fed directly into another miserable, unending day spent in that nightmarish cavern, spent in service of the horrible, pitiable beast that sat at the center of that gargantuan room. He had to sleep. 
he had to throw himself into the suffering his dreams contained. Those inflicted upon him by his jagged, splintering psyche. The mind irrevocably damaged by guilt and hate and madness. And the sooner he got to his barracks, the sooner he could drink that swill, could ingest that sickening poison, the sooner he could dive into slumber, the more time he could spend regaining his strength so that he might expend it in the cavern once again. But that slave, insolent old fool with his shaking hands and his lame left leg he hoped to leave before maul before a king he hoped to get back to the barracks first before maul he hoped to steal from maul to steal his time no 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 maul would not allow it maul could not allow it. So as the doddering old fool limped along, Maul let out a roar, let out an impassioned threat, let out curses so terrible that they made his fellow slaves wince and cover their ears. He expended what little energy still remained in his mighty limbs after that interminable, back-breaking 14-hour shift. And he lunged forward. Before the old cripple could even turn around, Maul was upon him. The savage brute barreled into the skinny old man, hearing his brittle bones crack and crunch as Maul bashed his shoulder into him. This wasn't the old man's first day in the caverns. He knew the pecking order. He knew who Maul was and what he required, what he deserved. Maul was the best. Maul was a king. Even in slavery, he was a king, and he refused to follow anyone. The other slaves knew. How could they not? And they looked on in silent, rapt terror as Maul reminded the old man, that weeping cripple, why it was he, why it was Maul and Maul alone that deserved to go first. Maul lifted his head and he cackled, not with glee, but with horror, at the world he had fallen into, at what it had made of him, and of the brutal, utter necessity. What he must do next. Without ceasing his laugh, the one that coaxed tears from his big, wild eyes, Maul lifted his foot and stomped downward, driving his heel directly into the old cripple's leg, his one good leg. Maul ground his teeth together as he smashed his foot down upon the old man's thigh again and again, shattering the bone, the one that once coursed with vitality, breaking it so completely that it burst through the old man's thin, parchment-like skin, digging deep gashes into the sole of Maul's foot. The other slaves watched silently as the heavy breathing of the monster was soon joined by another no less terrible noise. The old man's weeping, howling cries. The lame old man who implored Maul, who begged him to put him out of his misery, to bring his powerful, savage foot crashing down once again, but this time upon his skull, upon his neck, pleading with Maul to take his life before his broken, useless, but still living, still feeling body was turned over to the cook and their grisly slop. But Maul had already wasted enough time, had wasted enough energy. Any time spent ushering that old fool, that insolent slave, into death would be time not spent asleep. But Maul scowled. He spat. He turned, and he trudged off to the barracks leaving the old man weeping in his wake. At the entrance to the barracks, Maul received his wages, the meager pile of worthless ceramic chips that the proctors handed out to each of the workers, to those who returned from their shifts. Though Maul and the others were paid, 
who knew the truth. They weren't workers. They were never workers. They were slaves. They were held captive by force, by threat, and by cold, harsh realities that they could not change. Even their payment, their wages, they were nothing but a sop, nothing but a cruel charade. As immediately after receiving them, the bulk of those simple, crude ceramic chips were taken from them for room, for board, for the tools they used in their work, for the very poison that was slowly but surely killing them all. The proctors gave them their coins and immediately relieved them of the same. And with what was left, the bulk of the workers, the bulk of those slaves attempted to mask their misery, tried to perform happiness through consumption. They bought seats at filthy tables manned by grinning proctors. They gambled their wages away with ridiculous, ludicrous hopes at buying their freedom. While they sometimes took their fellow slaves' chips and sometimes lost their own, it was the proctors with the fee they charged for every game that always won. But Maul did not gamble. Maul made no bets except for those he knew he could win took what remained of his ceramic chips, and he did the same thing he did after every shift. He put them in the small cloth sack, the one he had stolen, the one he had liberated from a pile of equipment, and he saved them, hiding them within his rags before collapsing onto his bunk. But before he could fall into slumber, before he could even close his eyes, he heard a voice that shockingly spoke his name. Maul, King Maul, I can help you. Maul shot up as quickly as his exhausted body would allow, but before he could respond, the voice spoke again. Careful now, they're watching. Always watching. As he looked out at the old man, the one from whom that voice emanated, Maul was torn. On the one hand, he knew that while the proctors permitted fighting on the job, they forbid any violence at all within the barracks. On the other hand, Maul had seen that old man before. His image had been burned into Maul's memory, that wizened, wrinkled old face covered in that angry purple birthmark. It was the wizard, the one who had sent him, had sent Skog cascading into that broken, dying world, the one who had condemned Skog to death. Maul struggled to settle upon a course of action. And a growl rose up in his throat as he struggled to put his shattered thoughts into words. You, Hanno, you sent us to that house, but you were already there, and you sent us to that broken world. You sent us to our deaths. You sent Skog. The old man shook his head and raised his hand slowly. No, you are confused, my king. Though we look alike, though we share more than I would care to admit, I am not my brother. Maul glanced to his side, hoping to find the proctors, the ones who guarded the barracks, preoccupied. When he turned back to the wizard, he wore a look of disappointment on his face. Speak plainly, 
worm. The wizard rose from his bunk and slowly approached Maul. He is Heno. I, I am Patro. Maul put his hand to his throbbing head. He was more confused than ever, and he could feel the jagged pieces of his psyche grinding against one another as they once again tried to make sense of the world around him. I don't... I don't understand. This... This is Ravenna? The old wizard frowned. Yes. It's what's become of it. Together, we might change that. Maul closed his eyes hard and pinched the bridge of his nose. But how? What happened here? How did this happen? The wizard reached out and touched a single finger to Maul's temple. Much can change. In a hundred years, my king. I hope you're digging Scald. If you are, please give the show a good review on iTunes, as it's the best way to get the word out about the only story that matters. Smaxel says, True entertainment and creativity. If you like sword and sorcery fantasy fiction, then this podcast is a must. The creativity of the story keeps you continually on the edge of your seat, wanting to find out what comes next. Not only is the story riveting, but the way the story is told keeps you from entering even a moment of boredom. Pure story and storytelling genius. Scald is made possible by one thing and one thing only. Scald fans supporting the show on Patreon. Scald is an old idea. One person, one voice, one story, one single take. But to keep it going, Scald fans need to embrace another old, increasingly forgotten idea. Paying for what you enjoy. Paying for the media you consume. A lot of hours go into Scald, and the only way for me to get compensated for them is through Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash Scald to sign up today. I would love to hear from you on social media. I'm Aubrey Citizen on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and Snapchat. Or hit up aubreycitizen.com for links to everything, including Scald, my wrestling talk show Straight Shoot, bio, contact information, and more including my comics work, like Street Fighter G.I. Joe, in stores right now. This week's recommendation is kind of a cheat, because it's more Scald. Just this week saw the release of Scald's third volume, entitled Broken World. This volume collects the prose from episodes 33 through 48, detailing the entirety of Maul's time in that shattered, dying hellscape. If you're new to the show and want to catch up quickly, or you're interested in reliving Scald's third cycle, the prose volumes are the best way to do it. Search for Scald on Amazon. Each volume is only $2.99. Thanks for listening. I'll talk at you next week.